Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Amy Zellico. If we could be uh, seated, we will get started. Um, it's terrific to be here. Thanks very much to NDR and NDU for inviting me to moderate uh, this panel on trade, investment, and finance uh, trends. I have to say, of course, the topic of this panel may not have been much interest to a strategic discussion of the US and Asia in years past, but this year, today, we're in the bullseye. <laughs> so one of the most significant trends from my very narrow perspective uh, from Albright Stonebridge Group, where I'm advising American and European companies on navigating, operating in the China market, is of course the bleeding of national security into economic policy making uh, across the board. This has had a significant prospective impact on American competitiveness, on the global economy, and of course, on our security. In the US, this overlay of national security on economic policymaking is of course seen in the enhanced CFIUS investment uh, screening review processes, the enhanced export control processes now underway at the Commerce Department, and the use of tariffs, uh, not just against China, but against our closest allies to protect our national security. Of course, in China, um, national security has been intertwined with economic policy making for years. China's new cybersecurity law could limit foreign investment in major swaths of the Chinese economy. China is now, for the first time, drafting an export control law and its new draft national security management list could restrict foreign access to Chinese technologies. Finally, of course, China's new and as yet unpublished unreliable entity list could punish individuals, enterprises, and companies who are quote unquote harming China's economic interests. All of these policies are founded in national security considerations. So fundamental to a discussion today about the increase in restrictions to trade, investment, and finance flows is an acknowledgement that many of these tools being used here in DC by the administration and by Congress are meant to protect our military's advantages and our economy's competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis China, especially in the areas of technology and investment. And while there's no getting around that there's a rise in true national security-based threats that need to be addressed through some restrictions on trade, investment, and finance flows, it's important that this discussion include how to quote-unquote right-size the threats that we face. China's having a host of strategic security implications on our future relationship with it due to the policies it is taking. And of course, for the United States, the implications are not just set in relation to US-China relations, but US relations to the entire region. So for example, in my world of commercial issues, this more restrictive US and Chinese trade, export controls, procurement restrictions, investment review procedures, they all together increase supply chain uncertainty and incur costs for American companies with the potential to damage the US economy and competitiveness of American companies on the global stage. Today's conversation on these trends is not just about US-China competition. China's investment and financing mechanisms being deployed through its still hard to define Belt and Road Initiative the impact of a slowing Chinese economy on the rest of Asia, and of course, China's own national security ambitions and goals. All of these touch on trade investment and finance policy and encompass much more than a focus today in Washington, DC on President Trump confirming that he will meet with President Xi Jinping on the sidelines of the G20 in two weeks from now. Even more broadly, struggles with the adverse effects of globalization 
an increased protectionism around the world, as well as the emergence of a US absent CPTPP are also realities that shape the future of American engagement in Asia. And we have three experts here who are going to dive into elements of all of these trends. Starting from the big picture and then moving to more specifics, first up, we will hear from Thomas X. Hamas, Distinguished Research Fellow at NDU. Having retired from active duty after 30 years of service in the US Marine Corps and holding degrees from the US Naval Academy and Oxford, Dr. Hamas's many areas of expertise include future conflict, military strategy, and insurgency. And today he will talk about the reverse in globalization trends that impact us all. Then we will hear from Claire Reed of Arnold and Porter and senior associate with the Freeman Chair uh, in China Studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She will discuss China-US trade and investment developments, bring us up to up to date on what we can expect going forward and how it will impact the region. Mentor, friend, former colleague, Claire uh, and I first met after she had already served as a senior international trade partner at Arnold and Porter, and she was the first chief China trade, uh, chief counsel for China trade enforcement, enforcement at the office of the US trade representative she subsequently served as the assistant U.S. trade representative for China policy for six years, leading our trade and investment discussions with the Chinese government, as well as with authorities in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Mongolia. Finally, we will hear from an NARP fellow, Dr. Michael Beckley, currently assistant professor of political science at Tufts who will discuss possible Chinese economic stagnation and how that could affect China's security policy. Like Claire and TX, Dr. Beckley is no stranger to Washington, D.C., having worked at the U.S. Department of Defense as well as RAND and the Carnegie Endowment. His research focuses on China's rise, and he holds a Ph.D. from Columbia University. What a treat to have your combined expertise today. Each speaker will talk for 10 to 12 minutes and then we're going to open it up for discussion. I know I personally am going to be interested to hear from all three of you whether these current trends are reversible in the future. Turn it over to TX, thank, thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, it's kind of a bad news, good news thing. The bad news is you're gonna have to listen to a Marine infantryman with a degree in history talk about economics. So that could be a little iffy. <laughs> The good news is I'm an old guy, so I know I'm between you and the bar, so we'll keep it short. Um, I looked at fourth industrial revolution over the last four years, and what I've discovered is that about since biological worlds impacting all disciplines, economies, and industries. So I first started looking at it from a warfare point of view and then expanded it and looked at the indicator, the first indicator I saw, you've got a chart on your desk, hopefully you're sitting next to a young scholar so you can actually read it. Um, the total trade is a percent of GDP. You notice that it, it's got China, the US, <clears throat> and the world on there. And what you see is a steady increase until 2007, the crisis, a sudden dip, 2008, and then a very rapid recovery up to 2011. And I use total or GDP trade as a percent of GDP as a measure for international trade, as a measure for how much of your economy is dependent upon globalization. But then in 2011, you see it start to decrease and it increases steadily until right at 2017. And there are some indicators that the blip in 2017 was an effort to beat the tariffs because there's a huge increase in the movement of goods as people stock up their inventory before the tariffs take up. So I think actually taking that out, you've still got a decline. The second indicator, the second slide shows merchandise trade as a percent of GDP. And you see that blip from the sudden buying to beat the inventory. Your third slide, global financial flows, is interesting. This was done by real economists, so I couldn't extend it out to 2017, but you'll see the huge amount of global trade, it doesn't recover. It stays low until 2014. You're still seeing it fairly low. In fact, about a fifth of what it was before. Now that current, when I get to current FDI trends, is not as to total as global financial flows, 
But using foreign direct investment, investment as a measure of how much confidence I have that international trade will continue, you see that uh, spike up in 15 and then drop off. Again, when the tariff conflicts start, the possibility of if I invest, am I going to be able to export from that country? Those sorts of questions. So financially, we're seeing that drop. The question is why? Why are we seeing deglobalization? Well, it's not new. It's happened repeatedly through history. What is different about this is normally it's political or security driven. For instance, the Smoot-Hawley tariffs in the 1930s crash everything. That's the political aspect. The security aspects, World War I, the world is more globalized in, in 1914. It will not reach that level of globalization until again until the 1970s. That's how seriously World War crashed the thing. <clears throat> but that's the traditional way. What's different today is that I think two of the big things are technology, and I'll explain how that's changing it, energy production, which changes energy flow, and then social factors and political factors. The technology drivers, one of the most important is advanced manufacturing. Now, particularly 3D printing driven by artif task-specific artificial intelligence. For instance, supply chain, GE Europe, tasked their, their 3D printing team to look at a small aircraft engine they had for a 10 passenger aircraft. It had 835 parts. The new one, which is 3D designed and printed, has 12. That's a complete collapse of that supply chain. There's no sub-assemblies assembled in Southeast Asia shipped to China for final assembly ship. They're just print on site. We'll see more and more of that. And it's not just one-offs. Uh, Maybelline has those little eyebrow brushes the little plastic ones, they are printing a million a month out of a single facility in Southern California. So this is now a mass production tool and changes things a great deal. Uh, also because of the energy, we'll talk about how that affects plastics. But robots are also having, industrial robots, everybody's familiar, the big ones bolted to the floor with a cage around them so they don't kill anybody. The cost of those is down to $7.50 an hour operating cost. Chinese labor is $14 an hour now. Now, what's interesting about that is China is the biggest buyer of industrial robots in the world. The next step is collaborative robots that work next to you, and they augment a human and sometimes replace. For instance, in the BMW plant, their workers are getting older, average age 48, so they can't lift the parts overhead. It used to be a two-person team. Somebody lifted the part in place, the next guy bolted it. The robot now lifts the parts in place, the other guy bolts it. But a collaborative robot won't crush you. It works with you. It's also reprogrammable by the operator, no special code and comes in at $20,000 a copy. So co labor costs about a buck an hour. They've got a single arm robot now that's $14,000 an hour. So those are coming. Social programs are changing uh, services because they're doing the jobs here. Bookkeeping, uh, answering telephones, phone banks, reprogramming computers, radiology, oncology, uh, apprentice lawyers are all being done by software now. And finally, SOBOTs, and SOBOTs are going to be a massive impact on the third world because sewing has always been a very human skill, very difficult to do. But DARPA funded a program to teach robots to do this or make a machine do this because we have to buy uniforms from U.S. providers. So they developed a machine now that can do jeans, T-shirts, hats, and shoes. So you get unique, customized shoes or shirts or pants. And they're beginning to, there are 20 of these production lines now in use in the United States. This is a huge problem for Vietnam. 67% of the women who work in Vietnam are in, in the textile industry, over 80% of Bangladesh. And that may affect some things very, very seriously. The key thing is the cost of labor advantage is disappearing. So production is re returning to home markets. And we actually saw that uh, there are other drivers of that. Socially, environmental concerns, people want the local war movement, the local production movement likes this idea that was made down the road, mass customization, People, hey, if I can have shoes made just for my feet, I'd rather have them if they're roughly the same cost, and we're getting there. And then the speed of shift to new products, you can very, very rapidly change what you're doing. Um, political, of course, populism, we saw it in the last election, we see it in all the elections in Europe. Populism driving protectionism is changing it. And then interesting, the internet, one thing that was gonna unify the world, and man, nobody can stop this thing, it's gonna make everything, the signal will get through. But China disagrees. And between the great firewall, the great cannon, and social score, they're successfully cutting China out of the internet for things they don't want them to see. Russia's subcontracting with the Chinese, the Iranians are subcontracting, authoritarian governments all over the world are starting to do this. 
Then there's the impact of energy use. Now we've got fracking, everybody's familiar with the tremendous change fracking has made. It's interesting that with the news in the last couple of days of blowing up tankers in the Gulf, 20 years ago, we got these huge oil spike prices. We're up a buck or something today. So it's no big deal because we're the swing producer. But just as important for deglobalization, all of the plastics and petroleum product plants were moving out of the United States because natural gas was the precursor and too expensive. With fracking, natural gas in the United States is now the cheapest in the world and they've moved back. So we, we dig up the petroleum here, we process it to plastic here, we use it here. That completely changes the supply plan for an enormous number of petroleum-based products. Uh, and then uh, renewables. Two years ago, 68% of all newly installed energy in the United States were renewables. By 2035, 50% of the planet is supposed to be using renewables. In fact, Teresa talked about this earlier. I don't know, I was out doing a different talk. Um, so that changes things because renewables are inherently local. You don't produce wind energy in America and sell it to China, despite China's odd fantasy about this, this global network. So what's the economic impact of IR? Well, greater global prosperity. We're gonna have more stuff, faster, more suited to us with less waste and cheaper as we learn the energy pieces. The problem is there's gonna be initially greater economic disparity. This has happened with each of the economic revol or each of the industrial revolutions. There are losers and people left behind. And that is part of the problem we saw with the last election and the discontent in large parts of America and Europe. But the other thing we're gonna see is a reduction of globalization not so much total deglobalization as regionalization of economies. North America is already pretty regionalized. 84% of the U.S. economy, GDP, comes from America, Mexico, or Canada. Only 16% from the rest of the planet. And that is going down each year because of uh, this. Europe and Asia are trading blocks already. Europe, by DHL standards, is the most globalized economy in the world. But you dig into their numbers and you find out, oh yeah, but 70% of it's traded in the core of Europe. They just moved it 50 miles and crossed two borders. So that counts as international trade. Asia is becoming a block around China. That means premature deindustrialization for Southeast Asia, Africa, the Middle East. They don't have that step the tigers have taken from light industry to medium to heavy. Uh, that's going to be a huge problem because these are the people reaching youth bulge at exactly the time the jobs they needed are going away. They're going to be replaced by robots. And the security impact, one of the things that worries me is the U.S. will be more reluctant to engage for a number of reasons. First off, traditionally, if you scratch an American very hard, you usually find an isolationist. The second is the increasing in independence. Why do I need to go out in the world? Americans would really be in a kerfuffle 20 years ago about the Middle East. Right now, their reaction is, oh, well, that's their problem, not our problem. In fact, the president said that on television. Um, the cost and bad experience of, of interventions were 19 years or 18 years into the Afghan adventure, spent trillions of dollars, don't seem to have gotten anything out of it. That's just going to get a lot worse. Debt, and then more Mr. Trump's outlook. The key concern is alliances are under strain already. This is going to multiply the strain on the alliances. And if you're a believer in international alliances, and I am, we're going to have to work hard to overcome these things. And with that, I'll leave it. Claire. Well, that was really an upbeat <laughs> assessment of what the challenges are. We have no challenges looking looking ahead. Well, so then if we take a look at the trade and investment environment with China and the United States, um, we don't get a rosier picture. Um, I think that uh, we are going to be seeing a much more complex and constrained environment on the trade and investment side of the equation with, with the U.S. and China. And I think we're going to see more uncertainty for the next several years uh, caused by markedly less trust, by more rigid defensive policies taken by the United States, uh, by the Trump-created policy uncertainties and scapegoating, frankly, by retaliation on the Chinese side. And uh, Amy mentioned some mirror measures that China has already taken, plus the effects, frankly, of President Xi's governing approach and then the efforts by both sides to win allies and create you know, more strength for, uh, for each side of what is beginning to look like a pretty restive relationship. So let's break this down. So first, um, I do think, and I think there's been a lot of discussion about this today, that there has been a significant and likely permanent change in the degree of US skepticism about China's trajectory in terms of its development.
as well as the consistency of its goals with a stable and open international trade and investment system. So why? Well, um, some of this has to do with Xi Jinping um, and his China. He's clearly turned away from the 2013 third plenum with the market-oriented um, messages. He's clearly pushing to consolidate and strengthen his state-owned enterprises. He's doubling down on government intervention in the economy, both at the micro level and at the macro level. And his concern about Communist Party control is translating into controls inside companies, as well as the social controls that TX just mentioned. Um, there is this increasingly nationalist mes message that is not only um, creating a political environment, but also is having an impact in the economy, including making foreigners feel increasingly like the reason they're inside China is so that their advantages and know-how can be infused into the Chinese uh, DNA, and then the foreigner can be discarded. And there's a focus, clear focus, on getting Chinese entities into the global markets, into a globally um, strong position, but at the same time, keeping China's market closed as much as possible. So in short, Xi's China does not seem to be buying into at all the classic liberal market economy or the goal of we're going to have win-win with open trade. And by the way, uh, it's very clear, has been clear to me for, for the years that I've dealt with China, China does not have a culture of rule of law like, like many other economies do. And that's really fundamental. So rule of law is useful to China in the context of international agreements where a little bit of compliance on their side gives them an opportunity to have very open opportunities by virtue of other countries having to comply on their side. So when the balance of cost and benefit is right, then the rule of law or the global trading system becomes something that, that is defended vigorously. But on balance, I would say, I think fundamentally China has a zero sum game mentality and has a sense of needing to have a drive to do whatever it takes to get the advantage and to win. And, you know, in this context, of course, economic development is critical to Xi Jinping and his maintenance of control because for all of the efforts to eradicate corruption inside the, the Communist Party, for the ordinary Chinese person, it's really going to be, is my life getting better? That's going to be a metric for whether things are going to be considered to be going well or not. And given that China right now is behind other economic powers, I think there is a very urgent drive inside China to catch up and to take its rightful place in the center of the universe, right? China, the word for China, Zhong, is center, right? So that's something that is also, I think, in the DNA. And that then serves to justify the aggressive actions on intellectual property, the aggressive technology transfer pressures, trying to leapfrog ahead to get to where they need to be, and also the kinds of, of actions being taken opportunistically with smaller economies, particularly around Asia, but also in Latin America and Africa, in terms of trying to build those uh, opportunities to develop strength. Now, it's not all on the China side. Of course, on the US side, uh, some of the baseline change has to do with the adverse and sort of increasingly grinding problems that uh, foreign companies are feeling in terms of their, their uh, interactions with China. It's always been challenging. And in some cases, you know, in the 1960s or 70s, if you talk to people who were in China at that time, super challenging at that time. But now the environment is challenging again, and the frictions are increasing again. And that sense of never, ever, ever being Chinese and never, ever, ever being equal is coming to the fore in many subtle ways for companies. But of course, the Trump administration has now taken this and made this headlines. So the aggressive calling out of troubling Chinese policies by the administration, some say, would have happened in some form if Hillary Clinton had been president, given where the trends were going. But the lack of strategy and that Trump scapegoating because of the political gains that you get from identifying an enemy and then 
pounding that enemy, that's a political calculus that he's making, a domestic political calculus. His instinctive use of tariffs as opposed to a strategic plan, you know, his, his punching allies in the nose when, it feels, when he feels like it, those kinds of really disruptive behaviors create a lot of unpredictability and uncertainty. And then because trust matters in the international system, it creates disruptions and uncertainties in the global economy and potentially dangerous broader problems. So it's a very, very risky approach. And the question nobody knows is for Trump, is this long-term or short-term? But it's, it's problematic. Now, but it's not just Trump in the United States. At this point, if you go to the Congress and you say, how do you feel about China? You will find no one in Congress that would say any more, be patient. China is moving towards our model. It takes time, there are steps forward, even though there are steps backwards. That was something you heard from certain quarters in, the Was in Washington, D.C. You do not hear that anymore. There is definitely a consensus, even though I would say there's a bell curve as to where people are, that steps have to be taken to assert and defend U.S. essential interests that have not been taken up till now. So what's happened in the last two years? Many different unprecedented US policy moves, unprecedented in terms of how many and in what areas. So the national security investment reviews that Amy talked about tightened and broadened significantly. The export controls now to be put on fundamental and emerging technologies. Who knows what that means? What are you going to do to be sure that that doesn't just cut off Americans from the global mind brain chain? Uh, how are you going to make that balance? Um, sanctions, trade actions of every single type. They took our international trade um, roster of, of, uh, of statutes and dumped the entire thing out on the table. And I swear to God, they've used almost every single one, ones that I, that I knew about only theoretically <laughs> they are now using. They've revoked licenses of Chinese entities, and they've also refused to give licenses to Chinese entities to, to operate inside the United States. You know the discussion of visas for students, for, for scientists, for professionals and these investigations and limits on collaborations that exist in the scientific arena, in academia, and with governments, things that and often are very long standing. Now, let me just step back for a second and say there is a bell curve of views inside the United States. Some US economic operators, and I would say particularly people who are sophisticated business people with a global perspective, are uncomfortable with a lot of what China is doing, but they see globalization as inevitable and they see China's market as irresistible. And they see that there has to be, in their view, a way forward where you can cabin in the interaction where you have essential security interests to protect them, but that you should be trying to work towards positive economic gains for all sides. Um, at the other end, of course, there's a serious concerns that some people have about security risk. And then that can be translated into seeing a security risk in every single economic interaction or most of them. And actually, China itself in its national security law um, actually creates the same problem. I mean, I think you could have a ballet school in China and a foreign investment in a ballet school in China could create a national security problem in China under the, <laughs> under the language of the Chinese statute. So, but the United States is tending, some are tending in that direction. And that's, I think, potentially problematic, even though we know that there are problems with excess capacity, with non-market behaviors that are very structural in the Chinese economy that are actually really creating ma major, major victims inside the rest of the world where you have market economy forces that do force your company out of business. So there are very serious concerns for sure. And then I think the most dangerous place is now this extreme where you worry about there being a new McCarthyism, a red scare, a kind of, 
uh, extreme racist almost response where you are then creating a lack of trust and an adverse environment that I think is very troubling for America and for our capacity to operate inside the world. Um, it's also unrealistic, frankly, unless the United States decides to develop a top-down industrial strategy that controls every corporation in America, that you are going to keep American business from interacting with Chinese business. It's just not gonna happen. And it's very hard to say that. And it's very hard to say that China has actually made advances in some areas on its own, by its own intelligence and good practice. It's very hard to say that now in the American environment. Now this change in attitude is gonna be important for this deglobalization that TX was talking about because it's not just happening in the United States, it's also happening in Europe and other parts of the world to a certain extent. So the caution and that skepticism about what China wants and how it's going about it and what kinds of problems that's gonna pose for the rest of the world, I think is real. Okay, so what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen in the trade, in the trade problems that the US now has? What's gonna happen in this whole next set of possible tariffs on $300 billion of US goods that are produced in China? Um, I think I'm gonna give you a very um, sort of cynical view. I think for Trump, it's gonna depend on his base and the stock market, okay? So on one, one scenario is that if he can do it because it's in some ways the lowest cost, he actually drags all of this out all the way up until just before the 2020 election when he can drop a great deal and no one will have time to be able to measure how great the deal is. Very low risk then from the political perspective, tough on China, solves, solves the China problem and sweeps into the election. However, if the stock market or his base or the threat of a recession, the Fed, any of the rest of this, create a crimp in that style, then I will say he'll move, he'll move faster and try to get a truce. For China, I don't, I think they really would prefer not to have a fight with the United States. They don't need it. They have a lot of economic challenges they need to be addressing. And the contagion of this US skepticism into the other parts of the global trading system is not good for them. They don't like it. Export controls, investment security, even the Huawei situation, even though there hasn't been a, you know, a, a blind adherence to the US view, I think it's still making a difference. Um, now, I'm just going to put into the equation right here one small wild card. I have heard that there's a sense that Xi Jinping does not always listen to his own advisors, that there is a tiny bit of Trump in him, um, and that he's not particularly sophisticated economically. And that creates uncertainties in the Chinese side in terms of Chinese policy, which creates another type of unpredictability. And the one crumb that is, for me, just keeps, you know, irritating me and it is, and I can't get it out of my head, is the fact that the breakdown in trade talks is extremely odd. If you look at it from my perspective as a China negotiator, and Amy may feel the same way. They said that the talks broke down because China at the very last minute crossed out all the references in the draft agreement to the idea that China, the promise that China had in there, that they would change their laws in order to accomplish certain goals. Well, I'm telling you, there is no way that Xi Jinping did not know that that was in there. And there is no way when you have a regular negotiation with China, if you try to push on them the idea that they need to change their law and promise it to you, the lowest level Chinese official, boom, reflexively will say to you, we cannot do that. The National People's Congress is an independent entity and we have no control over them. You in America, in the administration, cannot say that you will change a law because you have a Congress. We have the same system in China. Now we know they don't have the same system in China, but I, there it was an orthodoxy that happened every time. So there's no way that Liu He, when he was doing his negotiations and then when he brought them up to Xi Jinping, there's no way that there wasn't high level clearance to put that language in. 
So the fact that the language all of a sudden dropped out over a weekend with a massively redacted, you know, and edited text, that means that something happened. And it, I, the only thing that makes any sense to me is that Xi Jinping finally previewed it with like the senior, senior leaders, the old ones, and they went nuts. And then he threw Liu He under the bus and said, mm, we can't possibly do that. You got then the three principles that you can't ask China to change the law and everything broke down as a result of that. What does that say? That says to me that Xi Jinping, if that's true, that there is an issue about that sort of traditional sense of China being extremely strategic and conservative and careful in how it runs its policy. Okay, so that's a long story, but it does worry me in terms of the uncertainties. So could we get to yes? yes. We, we might, um, but uh, if we do, it's gonna take the United States realizing that there is a limit to the US leverage, that China does not need the US existentially, only 12% of their exports go to the United States. And so we're gonna have to be realistic on our side because China is not going to change any fundamentals in order to get a deal with us. That's a great way to lead <laughs> into Michael's. What if really China's economic slowing does happen? Okay, well, um, thank you for the introduction, Amy. Um, I'm sad to say I'm going to echo the pessimistic conclusion we seem to be selling here on the panel of doom. Um, the, basic, the, the basic conclusion I come to is that China's growth is probably going to slow dramatically over the next decade, and it's probably going to make U.S.-China conflict uh, more rather than less likely. And I think it's relevant to the preceding discussion because I think there's sort of an assumption among a lot of U.S. policymakers that if we can just hit China hard enough economically and really impose some serious pain that they'll eventually blink first and cave to US demands. And I used to think that was the case, but after studying this issue, I'm not so sure that that is the case. So uh, the first point, and really the motivation of the study, is that Chinese stagnation isn't a remote possibility. So I've looked historically, and no country has had China's current level of debt or its negative productivity growth or the rapid aging that's about to kick into effect without suffering a lost decade or at least several lost decades of sluggish economic growth. So that then begs the question, what would China do under these kind of conditions? And in the study, um, I, I look at history, first of all, and analyze every case over the past couple hundred years where a rapidly rising great power has then suffered a prolonged uh, growth slowdown. And then I apply lessons learned from that history to China today. Uh, there's three basic findings, and as I mentioned, all of them are pretty pessimistic. They all suggest that China would actually become more assertive and expansionist if its economy stagnates. So the first finding is that mercantilist expansion seems to be the historical norm. So nearly all of the rising powers that stagnated over the last couple hundred years tried to rejuvenate their economies um, through protectionism at home and also by trying to carve out exclusive economic spheres abroad. So basically, they try to offset their domestic economic problems by taking market share, by trying to seize resources, by trying to open up strategic buffers around them. Um, and the first thing I did when I started researching this topic was just make a list of every great power that has ever grown at or above 4% for at least 10 years, followed by another 10-year period where growth fell by at least 50% or more. And the list was, was basically a who's who of big time expansionists that you're all pretty familiar with. So obviously there are extreme examples like Germany and Japan in the 1930s, uh, the Soviets in the 1970s, the Americans in the 1890s after a series of depressions in the 1870s and 1880s, Russia in the 2010s. So the bottom line I take from this history is that rising powers generally don't mellow out when they hit a prolonged economic rough patch. They tend to go out and often rapaciously so. Uh, the second finding is that China seems to be a moderate to maybe even a high risk case. Um, history shows there's two main factors that affect the likelihood that a stagnating power will then resort to mercantilist expansion to solve their economic problems. China already scores highly by one of these factors and its score on the other is sort of rising. Um, so, so the first factor that seems to matter a lot and the one that China already scores highly by is the degree of state capitalism as a state ownership and state intervention in the economy. Because if the government has a direct stake in the survival of major firms, and if major firms have substantial influence in the government, then the state is more inclined and more capable of marshalling national resources 
to push abroad to try to expand market share when profits and employment start to dry up at home. Um, state capitalist regimes are also less likely to reform and open in the face of stagnation because doing so would disrupt the patronage networks that the regime depends on for survival. Uh, the second risk factor is the level of openness in the global economy. Um, how open are foreign markets? How secure are sea lanes? If the global economy is open, then you can potentially rejuvenate your economy by just you know, through reform and opening. But if the global economy is closed, then you may have to physically push your way into markets and try to secure access to resources. So over the past two centuries, many of the most aggressive expanders were authoritarian state capitalists that suffered stagnation during periods of low global economic openness. Today, China is by any measure an authoritarian state capitalist country. And while the global economy is still relatively open, in fact, fantastically open by historical standards, the trade war that we're all talking about here might be closing it in ways that threaten China's long-term economic prospects. So China's looks like a risky case. Um, the, third, the third finding is that China, to my mind, is already sort of going down this, this historical pattern. So since 2008, uh, China's growth rates have fallen by more than half. Productivity has been negative for a decade. Uh, debt has quadrupled. And in response, the regime has basically gone out on a large scale. Um, so it's quadrupled outbound investment, um, largely as a way to stimulate demand for Chinese goods and to capture raw materials. Then to protect those investments, China's also gone out militarily. So it's tripled its procurement of long range uh, naval ships. It's quadrupled its port calls. It's quintupled its slock patrols. Um, it's been, of course, militarizing features and it's increased its use of coercive maritime actions. So those are like physical interventions to bully uh, other neighbors um, by, according to some data sets, sevenfold just in the last 10 years alone. Now, the standard narrative is that all of this assertiveness actually stems from uh, China's growing power and confidence, so rising power, rising ambitions. But the fact that the assertiveness correlates with a serious economic slowdown, as well as a rise in societal unrest and government repression in China, makes me think that the reality is actually a little bit more complicated. So China has certainly become more cocky and well-armed abroad, I think it's fair to say, over the past decade, but it's also become increasingly insecure at home. So it's this dangerous combination. And that's because for the first time in more than a generation, the Chinese Communist Party is facing a sustained drop in growth year after year of lower and lower growth rates. China has had lots of short-term recessions in the past, since 1979. Um, but it always found a way to sort of stimulate its way out of them. Now stimulus is not working. So since 2008, China has been rolling out an Obama-sized credit package every three to four months, and yet growth continues to uh, decline, so to no avail. So there aren't really any clear domestic remedies to China's economic problems, and that then may generate incentives for China to go abroad, to pad profits, to um, maintain employment, to lock down raw materials. And so my research suggests that these incentives at least partially explain China's assertiveness and expansion over the past decade. And I worry that this pattern could be just a preview of what is to come if China's economy slows further in the years ahead and the CCP is, is further pressured. So what does this mean for US policy? I think, um, number one, I think it means we need to prepare for prolonged competition with China, um, as much as I hate to say it. Um, you know, because it seems like China could continue to expand even if, it's, even if it stops rising economically. Um, because at the end of the day, the CCP prioritizes regime security. That security requires growth and employment. That growth and employment increasingly requires privileged economic access abroad as the domestic drivers of growth um, dry up. And unfortunately, that means there's probably no grand bargain to be had um, between the United States and China because the two countries' economic spheres of influence overlap in key areas and put them on opposite sides of thorny disputes over not just territory, but also, of course, the, the economic rules of the road. Um, I think the results also mean it's gonna be difficult for the United States to browbeat China into making serious structural economic reforms because uh, it's just really hard to see how the Communist Party could liberalize economically in a serious way without jeopardizing its political control and all those patronage networks it depends on. So I, I think we're probably in for sustained rivalry, even if China stagnates, even if China's growth slows. And so we need to get ready to deal with the knock-on effects of that competition. So some of them have been mentioned already, things like decoupled 
supply chains, um, militarized sea lanes, a, a splintered internet. Um, and so this means a, a big chunk of US foreign policy is gonna have to be taken up by cost mitigation, um, finding ways to develop supply chains that aren't critically dependent on Chinese components, unless 3D printing comes along and you know, saves us all. Um, defense concepts that can blunt Chinese gray zone um, activities, but don't trigger some horrible military escalation. Um, and then domestic redistribution mechanisms that will soften the blow to people that I think are gonna be frankly put out of business by the economic reshuffle that's going to take place. So that's the first implication. The second implication, and the shorter one, is I think these results um, don't just imply that there's gonna be US-China competition, but it also complicates how the United States should compete with China. Because if, if we knew that China would just retrench if its economy slowed, then I think US foreign policy would be relatively simple. You could compel Chinese concessions by you know, trying to choke China's economy and constraining its influence at every opportunity. But the historical records suggest that things aren't that simple. Um, and as much as we fear a rising confident China, I think that there's also reason to fear a sluggish flailing China. And so US policy needs some, uh, a balance between deterrence and reassurance. It can't just be competition all the way across the board. And that in turn requires a clear delineation um, between issues that are vital to US interests where we actually need to confront China head on versus areas where Chinese activities can be safely ignored and then areas where actually the United States should be encouraging Chinese assertiveness and involvement. So something like um, Belt and Road, I was really struck today by Joel Wolfgang's presentation um, where he started off and saying, look, we shouldn't be looking at this thing in a comprehensive sense. It, we should, and opposing it wholesale, we need to break it into discrete policies, some of which should be, should be supported while others should be contested. Um, so obviously there's, there's already great research by people um, in this room on these types of questions and we're gonna need more uh, in the years ahead. So um, I guess I'll conclude by saying I'm under no illusions that any of these implications or the mixed approach, this sort of modified engagement policy would seriously alleviate the US-China rivalry. But I guess I just hope it can reduce tensions enough to prevent a further slide towards something you know, approaching a cold or a hot war. So on that happy note, turn it over to questions. Thank you. I'm gonna try to find a silver lining here. Uh <laughs> So we, we've spoken a lot about trends, whether they're global or they're bilateral, that point to decoupling and increased tension and maybe reversal of open trade and investment policies. But is there another way for the United States taking China out of the equation in Asia? So my hopeful question to the three of you, is there a way for the United States to out open China uh, in the region, rejoin CPTPP and be a leader in the 21st century and reverse some of these trends that we're seeing where we ourselves are being more protectionist and close or our global trends as well as what's happening domestically going to prevent that from happening. Well, <clears throat> TX said if you scratch an American, you get an isolationist. Mm -hmm. And that's the political problem that we have in the United States in terms of getting into trade deals. You know, I mean, uh, there's a lot of discussion of uh, the, in the unfortunate fact that TPP didn't make it in the Trump administration. But I think there's many who would say that if Clinton had gotten in, I think she'd pledged she not to support it, right? So it, it's, t it's a tough sell for this American mentality that TX was talking about. I mean, it, I think it might be possible under another administration. I don't see it happening anytime here. And meanwhile, China's trying to join, right? So which would be a great political coup um, if they could make that happen. What do you think? I would love to propose some positive sum remedies. <laughs> um, I, I think right now, just the political trends in the United States make that very difficult and very unpalatable. But there, are, I think there are coercive measures that aren't nearly as hostile as the ones that the administration are taking that should at least be tried. So one that I've seen, and I'll defer to Claire on this because you're the WTO expert, but um, people proposed a big comprehensive case at the WTO that really marshals. I mean, everyone rips on the WTO as if it doesn't already have statutes against a lot of the things that China is doing illegally. But the US, EU, and Japan have already documented China's violations of a lot of these rules. And people say, if you brought this giant class action lawsuit that you could then marshal multilateral pressure 
which would then force China into a difficult choice on the trade issue. Um, on the, the tech issue, um, you know, it seems like the U.S. does is going to need to protect its IP, but that there are ways to do this in a much more targeted fashion than CFIUS is currently allotted to do. Or it, it seems like it can essentially nix any kind of technology agreement that involves China. Um, my, my students are actually part of this battle, so they, they've been trying to um, backtrack uh, companies, Chinese entities that are linked to either the Ministry of State Security or the PLA um, so that they can be blacklisted essentially. And so if you can actually do that kind of research and scale it up and combine this with, of course, the classified intelligence reports, you could then generate these more tailored lists of specific Chinese entities that need to be targeted rather than this sort of wholesale ban that gets into the kind of red scare fears that you talked about before. I think I can bring a little bit of good news. I think the fourth industrial revolution is going to favor the United States very heavily. We're extremely well positioned to take advantage of it. Until two years ago, we were also rated as the best place in the world to do business. The tariffs and things have bumped us back some. But in 15 and 16, there was record foreign direct investment in the United States, over $400 billion a year, and 70% was in the manufacturing. Get close to the market you're going to work in. So there's real potential for the U.S. to do extremely well here and advance quickly in these technologies. That then gives us the opportunity to offer allies, while we're not going to buy a lot of their material, we can offer them the technologies that allow them to produce for the local market. So while there never be a tiger in, you get to be a tiger by selling to the world, you can certainly do better by selling to yourself. Much like Africa leapt over the uh, wired phone system by going to cell phones. Mm -hmm. There are people who are developing 3D printers that are solar powered. So you'll no longer import cheap things from China, you'll make cheap things in your, in your own village. And I think there's a path we can take to reassure, and then on the military side, there's a whole bunch of things we can do to reassure our allies and uh, to uh, make China pause. Because much like the 1980s movie War Games, the only way to win this game is not play. The only way to win a war with China is not get in a war with China, because both sides are gonna lose that one. Um, so I think, if we start looking at the technology and how we can then, on the commercial side and economic side, offer a lot of this. And it's not high technology stuff. I mean, everybody's doing 3D printing, everybody's doing drones, everybody's doing task-specific AI. The specific technology is hypervelocity, uh, long-range weapons, um, nukes, things like that we keep. But the rest of it, we can be in a position to really share this in an honest way rather than in a chatness process of, I'll share it with you if I get most of the benefit. I'm going to open it up to questions. We started a little bit late, so I'm going to propose we go just five minutes over. And so that means we have less than 10 minutes for questions. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, your uh, mic's coming to you. So they changed the schedule before. So uh, Phil Saunders, NDU. This is mainly for Claire and Michael. Um, you're sort of talking about a battleground in Asia where the US and China are either competing for markets or competing for influence. And on the one hand, the implications of Michael's remarks are China will try to get a more exclusive economic access within the Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific, and maybe beyond. It's not clear why countries would want to sign up for that. So that kind of implies a more coercive set of policies. On the US side, as we move to decouple somewhat and move to kind of relocate supply chains, it's the, the Huawei case shows us pretty clearly that other countries don't share, share some of these concerns, uh, but there's others where they think the U.S. is way overreacting. And one suspects we're going to see coercive policies on the U.S. side to corral allies and partners into making economic decisions that accord more with U.S. security interests. So how is this going to play out in the Asia-Pacific context? maybe with the tri China seeking more exclusive economic access at the expense of others, uh, and the U.S. increasingly trying to muscle countries uh, to respond to its security interests and concerns. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if, if China necessarily needs to muscle its way in, so to speak, because it also has big wads of cash, yeah. which it can throw at corrupt regimes all throughout Eurasia. I don't think the United States can or necessarily should try to compete symmetrically in that battle, but the United States also has a lot of advantages that also don't necessarily involve coercion that it can use to combat some of that. So offering you know, higher quality kind of investments, um, offering transparent investments, um, marshalling the private sector, um, and of course providing technology that China may not have. So I, I don't see it necessarily as both sides 
forcibly corralling allies uh, throughout Eurasia and turning it into this sort of coerced Cold War. But I do see it as sort of, you know, the gravy trains on both sides are going to be opening up. And, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of these countries are up for grabs. Although I do think it's going to be very hard for the countries themselves, right? You don't want to have to choose. But I think that we've seen already, I mean, even in the context, I'm not, I'm not a military political person, but in the context of the South China Sea and the kinds of votes and whatever that you get or you don't get when it comes to codes of conduct in that area, you know, and even commercial exploitation, right? You, you see what the, what the implications are of those laws of cash. Um, so it's going to be complicated and very difficult, I think. Um, but I agree that it's probably going to be more carrots than sticks, although China likes to use its selective sticks. You know, there are small power, you know, the Philippines and, and the bananas and, you know, et cetera, Norway and salmon. I'll just add one thing about Huawei. I have to say, as we're, we're seeing with the Chinese visit to London this week, and the Brits coming back and pushing back against the United States, forcing us to make a decision. I think if the United States government does force countries to make decisions, we're going to be pretty disappointed with some of the answers that we get if we're not doing a better job with some of those carrots. And for companies impacted, they don't want to be anywhere near these decisions, particularly in an environment where we're hearing that the Chinese government is starting to tighten the screws against these companies who really are in some ways the biggest supporters of remaining in the China market, this massive economic market for companies. It's going to be harder and harder if the Chinese uh, government as well as companies in China start to, to increase pressure on them there. So both countries, the United States and China, have some real disincentives against pressuring countries and companies from taking sides on some of the on some of these issues but we're seeing it happen increasingly yes sir in the back hi uh, andrew Yeo, catholic university i have a question for for michael um a comment and a question so i as a political scientist i guess the, what's troubling is that that you're talking about stagnation and that's going to lead to greater assertion and conflict but Right now, if you look at China, the argument has been that it's because of China's rise, we're seeing greater assertiveness and conflicts. So in some ways, it seems uh, a little bit overdetermined. Um, but my question is, in looking at history, if the Chinese recognize that uh, if there is stagnation, that they're going to turn to more mercantilistic policies, if they recognize that things are just going to go down, and if you have conflict, that's going to make things worse. And so if, if, is there any sense of learning, or in the past, in the cases that you looked at in history, were there cases where leaders actually understand or learn that this could be problematic? And so you kind of hold back and say, wait a second, so this, things are getting really tense. We might be on the verge of war with the United States. Let's pull back a little bit. So I'm wondering if that's taken into account. And really, I'm just trying to look for a silver lining here because it's a pretty depressing panel yeah. in terms of the yeah. forecast. But um, perhaps Chinese leaders or even the US may be able to learn from history and, and maybe pull back if they see that we're on the verge of war. Well, I, I, I agree with your sentiment. I hope you'll go to Beijing and try to spread the word. But my sense is that it's, it's kind of like imperialism. You never mean to go in and become like a ultra colonialist power, but you have some assets over there and then you feel like you need to protect those. And then suddenly you're um, you know, seizing control of large pieces of territory. So I think with China, the problem is it's, you know, people assume that there's top down plans that just run everything on a purely strategic basis. But I think that underestimates the power of the state-owned enterprise bosses who say, look, we need profits. And if you want us to maintain employment and to secure energy supplies for you, the CCP leaders, that we need to be helped to go out and, and find those abroad. And so for domestic political economic imperatives, China may go abroad with no intention of, of causing great power or conflict or trying to overthrow the US-led order. It's more about regime security and these patronage networks. But then that tends to bump up against uh, the spheres of influence of other great powers. It also tends to put China in areas of high political risk where suddenly Chinese nationals are living and operating and under that risk, which then requires more of a Chinese security presence. So there's sort of a ratchet up effect that is several steps down the line. And even if Chinese leaders are, are aware, as I'm sure they probably are, 
they also probably feel that the risks in the long term can be managed and that the imperative is maintaining employment and profits um, for the economy because there's so much of their legitimacy and power rests on that. Yes. Uh, Chris Gueria, NARP fellow and also at the University of Albany. I don't want to start a fight on the panel, but uh, I wonder what sure. Michael thinks of the Colonel Professor TX's arguments. And it seems to me that there's there's a tension between the two arguments, right? That there was this wave of debates in the late 90s about does conquest pay? And I think that no conquest doesn't pay that much, basically won. And I don't quite understand the mechanisms undergirding Michael's arguments, especially if something like the fourth industrial revolution is happening. Yeah, you can bribe uh, Kazakhstan into having more Chinese market access, but that's not enough money to deal with the stagnation. There's just not a big enough economy to deal with the problems that China would be dealing with. So what's the point, right? So I don't understand that link between stagnation and aggression, which might have existed in the 1930s when it was much more industrial. You need those raw materials. I don't know what you're doing it for now because you can't coerce people to buy Chinese goods in a meaningful way. Uh, and so if, I don't see how they escape that, that trap that, that the history suggests this pattern comes from. Yeah, my sense is it's not so much about coercing people to buy Chinese goods. It's by investing a lot of money there. And when you look at how China invests there, they usually don't just pick, say, one company or build one road. They kind of build sort of an ecosystem yeah. um, in that country with the idea of, of generating a lot of economic activity, which then they hope will stimulate more. I mean, it already guarantees direct contracts for, say, Chinese construction companies. But then the knock-on effects they hope will be to generate more demand for Chinese goods. I don't think there's necessarily tension um, with the points about the fourth industrial Revolu revolution, because that seems to me to be more on the production side. You still need people to buy products at the end of the day, and you still need markets. And so it seems to me this expansion that China, that I, I already see China doing and that I think will become even more common if the domestic economy goes down, is really about expanding this market share by stimulating um, economic activity in not just Kazakhstan, but you know, 69 other, other countries across the region. The fourth industrial revolution is going to cause China some real problems. Like I said, they're the biggest market for robotics in the world today. They're desperately trying to recover the industries that moved out of China and moved to Southeast Asia. So that'll create tension there. The problem is if the money comes back, there's a fundamental rule of industrial revolutions is it favors capital over labor. I don't buy a machine because I want to pay you more money. I buy a machine so I can get rid of you. And that's what's happening in China. The industries are doing that. There will be <clears throat> an effort to reach out to create more market, I think. And I think this is part of their view of how they got rich was they started ports and then the ports did these industrial parks and industrial parks brought uh, development. They think, well, this is a great model to work for the rest of the world. But unfortunately, we know from a long time of aid effort that in fact, there are unique things that let that happen in China. That doesn't mean they won't do it because a lot of it's for domestic purposes. If I've got to use these excess people if I can ship them to Africa, let them do construction projects there, and then leave them behind, that's a win. Particularly if they can become the middle class of that country that they couldn't in mind, they can use their connections to China, which the Economist has done <clears throat> some studies on what's happening to the small store owner in the parts of Africa that the Chinese have moved into. And what happens is the laborers stay behind, use their contacts in China to get cheaper goods than the local people can provide. So they're destroying a whole business class. Now again, fourth industrial revolution may change that because I don't need to send to China for cheap goods, but it'll take a decade to two decades. How much damage can China do in that time? So it's not just, does it pay off in terms of money? But the real question of the Communist Party is, does it pay off in terms of longevity for the Communist Party? And if I can just keep kicking this ball down the road, maybe something good will happen. I'm afraid we've already run over. And so I'm going to wrap it up now and just please join me in thanking our panelists for this really fascinating.